there are Jewish folks in Israel and elsewhere that are disgusted by this treatment of African refugees and people who, as soon as that nursery was firebombed, they went out into the streets and protested against them and spoke out against this racism. But the problem is that they are a minority. <laughs> The 60,000 that took place just this Saturday, people came out. For the, for the Kremlin, this is, if you allow the opposition to take over, as they think, the Moscow city government, the next step with the Kremlin. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. Israeli settler gangs in the West Bank attacking a car and homes, they do so with total impunity. Unless they actually kill a Palestinian, they don't have to worry about a reaction from Israeli soldiers. The video came from the Israeli group B'Tselem. Israeli activist David Sheen talks about Israeli treatment of African refugees. What does that look like on the streets of Tel Aviv, where the majority of the African refugee population lives? It looks like graffiti, expel the N-word. It looks like firebombing the homes of African refugees and even firebombing an African nursery in Tel Aviv. And I suppose they didn't report that in Philadelphia papers either. This is our reality. Now, of course, again, there are Jewish folks in Israel and elsewhere that are disgusted by this treatment of African refugees and people who, as soon as that nursery was firebombed, they went out into the streets and protested against them and spoke out against this racism. But the problem is that they are a minority a small minority, and that they're overwhelmed by a massive majority of folks who want the Africans gone. The quicker, the better. So May 23rd, 2012, the Tel Aviv anti-African pogrom. A thousand Israeli Jews run rampant through the streets of Tel Aviv, attacking every African person they come across, smashing African shops, cafes, And why did they do such a thing? What triggered them? It was because Israeli members of Knesset and ministers stood on the podium in South Tel Aviv and incited against African refugees with Miri Regev, the top, official, top female official in the ruling Likud party. She says, the Sudanese are a cancer in our body. And in that word, she sent off these pogromists to do their dirty work. Now, I should admit that Miri Regev did apologize for what she'd said. 
<laughs> she said, I apologize. The problem is, she then explained, I apologize, I did not intend to hurt cancer patients. What? Sad that she compared Israeli cancer victims to Africans, not the Africans to cancer. This is how disgusting it gets. And what's the response of the organization that says that it's a Jewish civil rights organization? The, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. How do they respond to this pogrom? I mean, don't they, aren't they supposed to be an anti-racist organization? You'd think so, huh? Well, this is what Abe Foxman had to say about it. Among other things, that he sympathizes with Israeli citizens whose personal security has been compromised by the lawlessness engendered by these African refugees. And he praised Netanyahu, commended him for his commitment to resolving this crisis responsibly. That's the ADL statement on this pogrom. Of course, this is hysterical. What a joke. Thank you for doing our dirty work. Thanks to you for doing our Hasbara. So, of course, Netanyahu and Regev have a good time of it. If you can imagine, this was Netanyahu's leadership on this. How did he respond to the pogrom? He appointed that, that woman to be, in, to be uh, Miri Regev then became the chair. He appointed her to be the chair of the interior committee, the very committee that determines the fate of African refugees. So he put the pogromist in charge of the victims. Now, of course, since she's been moving up the ranks and into, into government, they need someone else to, to fill her space, another young um, ultra-racist, so Netanyahu has now tapped this woman to fill her slot. This is Mai Golan. Who's Mai Golan? Well, he's already ensuring that she's been well-funded by Kenneth Abramovitz, the head of Likud USA, okay, Netanyahu's political party's largest fundraiser in the United States. He's now not only funding Netanyahu, he's funding Mai Golan. Who's Mai Golan? Well, she's already been politically active for several years. How did she cut her teeth in the Israeli political system? She's been groomed for power by who is this man that's speaking in her, on her behalf? Who is Mai Golan and who is the man, Michael Ben-Ari, who's sponsoring her rise to power? This man, Michael Ben-Ari, is the head of the Kahanist movement in Israel. That's her political patron. Mayor Kahana, one and the same. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the backstory, this is the, basically the founding father of Israeli fascism. Okay? Uh, too, many, too many details to go into, but basically this is the furthest right-wing party in Israel. And now Netanyahu is bringing them into the government, if you can imagine that. So it's not only, this is at the memorial service, the annual memorial that celebrates Meir Kahana, the man who made it popular to call for ethnic cleansing, who, who made it no longer a, a badge of shame to call for eliminating non-Jews from the country. So not only does he praise Kahana at his annual memorial service, but Mai Golan does so as well. This is who Netanyahu has made. This Kahanist is now the youth representative of the Likud party. She has gotten the slot on the Likud list, and once elections occur in just two weeks' time, she's going to be elected to the Knesset. This is now another member of parliament. Someone who I have personally filmed in downtown Tel Aviv leading anti-African rallies, screaming, I am proud to be a racist. Screaming, may you be raped in your grave. Yes. Poetic. Well, what do you expect? With this level of incitement, it has a result. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. That's right. And so what happens in the years that follow? We see an Eritrean refugee family on the streets of downtown Tel Aviv. Father, mother, two young daughters, and this one-year-old baby girl. An Israeli Jewish man walks up to the family and stabs the baby in the head. Three times. Thankfully, she survived, not without damage, of course. She did manage to pull through. Now, and again, I don't mean to suggest that this is like commonplace, that people are slaughtering African people in the streets willy-nilly. Obviously, anyone who stabs a little baby, a one-year-old baby, is psychotic under 
any measure, right? We can't say that all is really, nothing, no, no, nothing even remotely close to that. But the issue is, why did this psycho stab a black baby? Why did he choose an African refugee family to attack? And the, he explained his reasoning, even though the police at first said, oh, no, no, there's nothing to do with racism. Yeah, yeah, okay. Once they interrogated him, he explained it in detail. He said, quote, I tried to kill her because I hate them. They're black. A black baby, blacks in general, are terrorists. Well, she wasn't the last victim. The following year, this man, another refugee from Eritrea, Haftum Zarhum, he was lynched in the Beersheva Central Bus Station. This man, Babakir, he was a refugee from Sudan, and he was lynched in downtown Petah Tikva. Petah Tikva is a suburb of Tel Aviv. He was lynched right in front of Petah Tikva City Hall, beaten to death, just like Emmett Till, because he spoke to some white girls, some Israeli teenagers. He just walked by and Oh, blah, 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 exchanged a few words with them. The reason we know this is because it's all on CCTV. It was right outside the city hall. So there's evidence. So you see, he walks over to them, uh, talks to them, and then walks away after 10 seconds, posing no threat whatsoever. Seconds later, a group of Israeli youth jump on him and pummel him and beat him for an hour and a half right outside city hall for daring to speak to Jewish girls. So how did they even know it was him? Just like Emmett Till, they, they crushed his face. They, he was unrecognizable, even to his own brother afterwards. The only way they were able to recognize him is because since he was a refugee from Darfur and he'd escaped the ethnic cleansing there, he had lost some of his fingers in the fighting. And so because he lacked some fingers on his hand, his brother only that way was able to recognize him. That's how badly he was pummeled. As you no doubt have heard, President Trump convinced his buddy Netanyahu to not allow a member of Congress with Puerto Rican heritage and a member of Congress with Palestinian heritage to enter into Israel. I could have a lot to say, but I saw this comment by Sean and Sean of Passaic, New Jersey in the New York Times. It was recommended by over 2,000 readers, so I'll read it to you. It is unconscionable a sitting president would denigrate prominent members of our own government to a foreign power. The Trump, that Trump has singled out these congresswomen for their religion and likely race is even more egregious. If anything, Trump should be encouraging Israel to extend the same courtesy and welcome to these American citizens and members of Congress that would be offered to any other. If Israel would deny entry to suppress their voices of protest regarding Palestinians, that's their right according to their laws. Trump should not facilitate nor influence that decision. Well said, Sean. I'd only like to point out that the Congress, which Trump and Netanyahu spurn, sends Israel $3 billion a year. On July 31st, business leaders and Connecticut politicians opened a methane burning power plant in Bridgeport, Connecticut. They patted themselves upon the back for bringing more clean burning natural gas into the city. It was a disgrace. The plant will send out less pollutants in the immediate neighborhood, but will actually send out more of the global warming gas, CO2, into the atmosphere. Lots more. On average, the coal burning plant that's there now is sending out 300,000 tons of CO2 on average over the last three years. The spanking new methane plant will shoot 1.6 million tons, more than five times as much. The one planned for Killingly, Connecticut is even worse. The company there is not replacing anything, it's building 
a new methane burning power plant to produce electricity that it will sell out of state. There's already a methane burning power plant in that town throwing out 2 million tons of CO2 a year into the air. The new plant, the Killingly Energy Center, will send another 2 million tons out each and every year. All this when UN scientists tell us we have to cut back CO2 output almost in half in just 11 years. The permits for the Killingly plant have all been given the okay, but the ground has not yet been broken. At this point, only popular pressure on the governor will stop this dangerous plant from being built. September 20th through 27th, a week of climate strikes and other mobilizations. See 350Connecticut.org for details. Russia. 60,000 brave Russians demonstrated against their ruler Putin, complaining about an upcoming fix in municipal elections. They are brave because Putin's system brutalizes and tortures Russians and maybe even assassinates them. From Democracy Now!, an interview with Nina Khrushcheva. It's not just the Moscow political crisis that is taking place now in Russia, it's the Russian political crisis, because suddenly uh, something that seemed to be such an eventful event, uneventful thing as the Moscow city election, became, uh, uh, became the event that suddenly the whole Russian police and all the, all the branches of the Russian police, and there are very many, and you see it in, uh, in the footage, there's this... Uh, people who called cosmonauts there in, in, in those black helmets and the uh, Russian guards and so on and so forth. So suddenly the Kremlin took over, because for the Kremlin, the way I understand it, uh, the way I see it, from, you know, from few thousand to the 60,000 that took place just this Saturday, people came out. For the, for the Kremlin, this is, if you allow the opposition to take over, as they think, the Moscow city government, the next step with the Kremlin. And since Putin, at least for the last decade, has run Russia as a besieged fortress, and it's not just the, uh, against the, the West besieged fortress, but also from uh, people uh, that uh, question his regime, then becomes a very scary proposition. So suddenly, from a very small event of local elections, it, become, it became an anti-Putin demonstration, or at least the way they are framed. And so, of course, no surprise, police got in, and now it's the power ministries that are basically uh, running the show and saying, you know, all these democracy games, they're ridiculous, look what happens. And they're looking at Hong Kong, because we have 60,000, and Hong Kong had 200,000, many more than 200,000. So they're looking at Hong Kong, and I think they really decided that uh, nobody is going to pass through this, and they are going to stand firm, and uh, all these democratic games um, essentially over, as they, I'm sure, they feel. And uh, I think the kind of the difficult part for all of us, and I'm going to Moscow in a few weeks to, because I'm basically missing this great awakening of, of uh, new renown, new sort of the new dissidentship that we're experiencing. I think the big question for us is uh, how this regime is going to essentially become uh, more Stalin-esque than it already has been. But ultimately, when you make people more comfortable, people actually ask for the change of power. Because in many ways, in many places, and I did travel across Russia two years ago, in many places, it's not that they dislike Putin particularly. They're just incredibly tired of him. And after 20 years, that something happened to Brezhnev, something happened to Stalin to the lesser degree. And I think, in this sense, that Kremlin power has exhausted its potential. And who are the leaders of the interview took place just before an explosion 1,200 miles northwest of St. Petersburg, Russia, on its White Sea. Apparently, scientists were working on a government nuclear powered cruise missile, and it blew up. What did Putin think he was doing? 
where did he think he was going to test this thing? Wherever it landed, nuclear radiation would be spread. Perhaps he didn't care. Upon learning of the explosion, President Trump boasted in a tweet, we have similar though more advanced technology. We do. We were supposed to have abandoned this boneheaded technology years ago. Is Trump just lying or are we developing again this completely stupid weapon? Either way, we are back to the arms race, folks. CBS TV News reported on the mass layoffs at home improvement superstore Lowe's. It discovered when thousands of those workers recently got the boot, they received no notice and no severance. Instead, Lowe's, a profitable company that spends billions buying back its own stock, offered the equivalent of two weeks transition pay to full-time workers, some with the company more than a decade. Now, why do companies buy back stock? Well, with less on the market, the idea is the price of the stock will go up and the big guys will profit even more. You do remember all that money that was supposed to flow to good America first investments once Congress approved Trump's monumental tax plan. Well, Congress fell for it, but those jobs didn't appear. Last year, 2018, American companies spent $1 trillion buying back their own stock. Kashmir, a podcast from an Indian website. In this past week, we have seen a heightened level of repression in Indian-occupied Kashmir. There has been an additional troop deployment of 35,000 Indian troops on the ground. And this already adds to the existing 500,000 troops. We have to keep in mind that Kashmir is one of the world's most militarized regions. There has been an imposition of curfew. The army has physically taken over schools and college buildings. All businesses and public offices have been closed. There is a ban on public gathering. Pro-freedom leaders have been detained. Internet and communications are on a clampdown. And there is a long line for fuel, food and basic supplies. In addition to that, there is tensions and shelling across the line of control. What the Indian state is really created is a culture of fear, anxiety and uncertainty in Kashmir. What does the world's largest democracy plan to do in Kashmir right now? Kashmiris are fearing an imminent war and a brutal repression. There is also fear that Article 35 will be revoked, changing the demographics and furthering settler colonialism in the region. Many of us fear that the Indian audiences of the 24-hour news and noise channels have been primed to actually see these brutalities and repressions unfold. We've created an Indian audience that is absolutely okay seeing Kashmiris being brutalized. So what can we do? At the fundamental core of humanity, it's time for Indians to stand in solidarity with Kashmiris. We have to stand in solidarity with their aspirations for freedom. But more importantly, we have to hold the people that we have elected accountable because what India is doing right now in Kashmir is beyond legal. This is barbarity and this is brutality. On the website rpm.world, the top link is to news of the seizure of Kashmir by India's Prime Minister Modi and the fascism overcoming India. It links to a terrific article by Indian novelist Arundhati Roy. It also has pieces on the struggles in Hong Kong, with one of which is especially good, called On the Streets in Hong Kong. Again from Democracy Now!, Ibram X. Kendi, whose new book is just out, How to Be an Anti-Racist. 
Here he talks about the origin of intelligence tests. These are tests that were created by eugenicists. The, when you look at the person who created the SAT test, when you look at the person who first popularized the IQ test in the United States, these were avowed eugenicists. Well, go into that more fully. We've got the hour here, and this is an astounding history you write about. Well, I mean, Lewis Terman, for instance, who, who wrote a century ago this book called in which he sort of sought to promote this new IQ test that he had brought over uh, from Europe. In that, in that book, he talked about that these tests will prove that black people are intellectually inferior. I mean, it, this was the hypothesis that he put forth in a book that promoted the original IQ test a century ago. And Carl Brigham, who essentially established the SAT test a decade later in the 20s, was a eugenicist from Princeton. I mean, these are eugenicists who created these tests not just to prove that Latinos and black people were inferior to white people, but also to prove that women were genetically intellectually inferior to men, that poor people were genetically intellectually inferior to wealthy people, that Southerners, I mean, everyone, that non-Anglo-Saxons were intellectually inferior to Anglo-Saxons. And, and, and so the, this test, became the evidence that they had been looking for, really, for hundreds of years, to prove that people of color and poor people and women were intellectually inferior. So explain what the College Board has recently announced, that they are adding an environmental context dashboard um, for all students taking the SATs. What does this mean? I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, one thing I think many the College Board, ETS, some of these other institutions that have been under fire by not only anti-racists, but even parents who don't want their children being in these high-stakes testing environments. And, and I think they're figuring out new ways to essentially maintain the existence of these tests. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.